a lot for, for having uh, been with us. Um, just to introduce very shortly, the current account surplus of Germany is one of the big topics of the last decade, uh, certainly in international economics, and has become a special topic with uh, the election of uh, Donald Trump. And there's been a lot of discussion around and a lot of criticism of Germany. And still, we feel like it didn't really happen so much, except the, the virus, and we see a certain drop in, in the current account due to Corona, but nothing fundamentally structurally changed, despite of all this discussion. So uh, all the more we are happy, and we were very happy to see uh, and to read your book and your contribution to the global phenomenon of trade imbalances, trade wars, and uh, what it means, and especially the, the, the attempt to better understand where the German surplus and other imbalances come from. And we're especially interested, for sure, for in, in, in the German case and in, in, in Germany. That's why we wanted to discuss, discuss with you. It's to say one of the big topics that we are uh, discussing at the forum, uh, and we have a study commissioned um, that will be uh, presented in a couple of weeks by Achim Truger, Till van Treek, and Jan Beringer. And this is for us a huge opportunity to in bring in our discussion of today into this process of um, having this um, special study on how to reduce Germany's uh, current account surplus. And we are very happy to have Till, Till van Trick, who is one of the authors of the study with us, and he will comment your presentation. So I will immediately give you, um, give a hand over to you uh, for a short presentation of uh, your main ideas on, on this topic. And then Till will comment and we will have uh, hopefully uh, enough, uh, much time to, to get a discussion because there are a lot of people, as I know, in the room, sort of, sort of virtual room, who are very, very interested and very interested to ask questions. So go ahead, please, uh, Matthew. Uh, thanks a lot. So first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's, it's great to be able to participate in this. And <clears throat> one of the you know, unexpected side benefits of this conversion to Zoom is, you know, last night I was able to do an event in Hong Kong and now this morning I'm doing an event in Berlin and I haven't had to actually go anywhere myself. So it's wonderful to be able to, you know, these are important global ideas. So it's great to be able to, you know, do that and engage with you. The, the title of the book is Trade Wars Are Class Wars. And, you know, this is, and we really just wanted to be as unsubtle as possible, but that's, the, we put the thesis in the title that economic conflicts between countries should really un be understood as conflicts between economic classes that happen to occur across national borders. And the other way of thinking about this is that everyone in the world or almost everyone in the world is connected through global trade and global finance. And what that means is that changes in one place, one part of the world can have all sorts of unexpected and unintended consequences for people elsewhere. I think the easiest analogy for thinking about this is pollution. So for example, if you have a lot of greenhouse gas emissions coming from the US and Europe, suddenly Bangladesh is the one that ends up underwater. That's obviously, you know, that's just the nature of what it means to be an interconnected system. And the global economy is the same way. And it's really important because it means that what we think of as domestic economic developments often have really profound and important consequences for people in the rest of the world, even if the, you know, the people driving those domestic changes aren't thinking about it in those terms. The sort of flip side of this is that a lot of what we think of as being the really important aspects of trade policy are relatively insignificant when it comes to understanding these big you know, global trade questions. And that's really what our book is trying to get at, or what are the important factors, what's really driving it, and you know, what can explain the changes we've seen in particular over the past 30 years. So our main argument is that globally, the, the, the central development is you've seen a real concentration of the distribution of income and a shift that's meant that purchasing power has gone from you know, sort of the mass consuming portion of the population to uh, the very rich and to the companies they control. And that's only possible because there's been an, a sort of countervailing force, which is a very large increase in debt and indebtedness among everyone else. Because obviously you can't have the income of, of companies and income of, of the rich who own companies rise if no one else, if people are spending less. Otherwise, you know, that, that kind of transfer doesn't work. Income is coming from spending, corporate revenues are coming from sales. So the only way that's possible is if the change in the distribution of income is offset by an increase in debt. That's the global picture. 
that the, the reason why this leads to global economic conflicts between countries and trade wars and so forth is because the increases in debt and the changes in distribution of income are not the same you know, in every country. These aren't self-contained changes. So for example, and what I hope we'll be spending most time talking about today is that changes within Germany were not internalized within Germany at all. That in fact, the increases in debt associated with the changes in Germany's income distribution basically occurred entirely outside of Germany. You can see this also in our discussion of China before 2008. Um, and you know the flip side of this is that other countries had increases in debt even when they didn't have an increase in their in their domestic inequality. Most notably, uh, the so-called peripheral countries of Europe before 2008. The U.S. is an interesting counterexample, and we can get into that if you want. But that's that's sort of a you know a, a different element of, of the story. So I'm now going to you know mostly spend my time talking about Germany because that's that's what we're here to discuss. And I'm going to sh just share briefly you know a couple of pictures here. So. The, the main point that I think is, is, is worth understanding is that Germany's trade surplus, the shift in Germany's external position, isn't due to, I think, what most people would call competitiveness or even to a growth in exports per se. And it hasn't been good for the people who live in Germany. Instead, it's better to understand what happened as a compression of imports that was caused by a declining standard of living and declining incomes of the large portion of the German population. And that mechanically generated a trade surplus because the rest of the world had a different experience. And there are a lot of different ways of showing this. These are just two charts that I've made over the years in my, in my day job at Barron's. One is showing that despite, I think, what is, is commonly understood to be a successful record on, in Germany of creating a lot of jobs, partly as a consequence of the post agenda 2010 reforms, what we can see from the data is that at least since 1995, the net increase in employment entirely came from part-time work. And there are a variety of other things we can look at as well in terms of what segments of the population had a large increases in the employment to population ratio. It was mostly uh, people in sort of the 55 to 64 age bracket, people who would have otherwise retired early. Uh, there are a variety, you know, you can look at the difference between hours worked versus employment. But the basic story here is that that, you know, wasn't really something that came from rising domestic demand in Germany. It was essentially a shift in the composition of the workforce. The chart on the right is showing something which I think is really important and we're going to dig into a bit, which is, you know, what was the trade surplus actually doing for the people of Germany? And the answer is it basically was just boosting the, the, the cash flow of, of German companies. And, you know, essentially the, the change in the net operating surplus of German companies and the change in the trade surplus tracked each other quite closely basically since the early 2000s. And that makes sense if you think that Germany being a relatively open economy is one where its exports are basically going to grow at the speed of, of global GDP and its imports are going to grow more or less at the speed of sort of German domestic demand. And German domestic demand essentially is falling to flat between 2000 and about 2006 well, global GDP, even if it's slower in the 2000s, growing more slowly in the 2000s than it was in the 1990s, you're going to sort of mechanically see this increase in profitability. So, you know, then that, that sort of leaves the question of what actually happens. So we, we go a lot in the detail of this in the book, but the, the basic story here, there, you can think of several phases. The first is that after reunification, there was a broad-based expectation that um, bringing in West German managerial skills, West German capital investment, and West German you know, political and economic institutions would have quickly led to a convergence in East German productivity and living standards. And that would have made a lot of people a lot of money and would have been really good for everyone. Unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, that didn't work out that way. And so that by the time you get to the mid 1990s, the German government is sitting on a very large loss of the German of the East German enterprises that had been taken over through the um, I'm not going to pronounce this correctly, but the uh, the, the 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 fund that was created, the Schrödinger and the uh, you know West German businesses essentially you know felt that they had you know the the, the promises of prosperity that they'd been looking forward to uh, were were failed, and so they they had to they felt they had to adjust, and at the same time. Uh, you see a very different story in the Central and Eastern European countries, you know, Czechia, Slovakia, uh, Poland, Hungary, and so forth, that actually had become quite attractive as a source of, as a destination for German uh, capital investment. And you see basically a massive shift in the way German businesses are choosing to allocate their capital. That instead of investing domestically and paying workers at home, 
they are rapidly shifting and outsourcing. In fact, you see a decline in German manufacturing employment during the 1990s that's pretty comparable to what you saw in the United States after 2000. That contrary to this idea that Germany did a much better job preserving manufacturing employment than the US, if you start the clock in 1991, that the change basically in both countries has been essentially the same in percentage terms. And that you know, had pretty profound effects on the unemployment rate, had profound effects on the German government budget balance as you have a lot more spending on, on unemployment benefits and other forms of, of social assistance. And, it, and it, it led to slower growth. Now, what's interesting is that it didn't end up changing Germany's external position in the sense that Germany basically had balanced trade throughout the 1990s because the German household consumption ended up rising not rapidly, but at a relatively decent clip despite sort of the moribund business investment picture. And that was financed by a decline in the German household savings rate. You get to the late 1990s and the tech bubble appears. And this you know, temporarily leads to a, a situation where people in Germany think that maybe some of the problems had been fixed. So what's interesting is that if you go a little before that in sort of the 96, 97, you know, some serious German elites are saying you have to have a big wholesale change. You have to dramatically change the German welfare system. You have to slash German wages, you know, that's the only way to be competitive. So this, this sort of the germ, the seed of this idea is already planted, but it gets forgotten for a few years because you have the, the growth from the tech bubble. And one of the consequences of that is you have temporarily um, employment is rising. You have this sort of long running construction bust that stops. Uh, you have German corporate business investment, you know, rises pretty rapidly for a few years and things seem to be going well. But unfortunately, you know, the by nature of being that sort of an over rational exuberance and, and a tech bubble, it, it ends up bursting in, in 2000. In fact, even the losses on Germany's, you know, equivalent to the NASDAQ, the Neuer market were even more extreme than what you had in the United States. And you have a very severe decline in business investment in Germany that really hasn't recovered. And that also coincided with the decline in household consumption, house, decline in, in employment, such that overall domestic demand in Germany, as I said, was basically it fell by about, I think about 3% peak to trough, and then it didn't even return to its level in 2000 real terms until about 2006. So at this point, the German, you know, German government, German businesses are trying to figure out a solution to this problem. And what ends up coming about, which I think is, is very well known in Germany, <laughs> obviously, is, 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 you know, the Hartz IV agenda. And the basic idea, you know, there's been a lot of argument about it. I'm, I'm not entirely sure exactly how we can weight the importance of Hartz IV versus the things that came before. But if you look at things now, the, the situation is very clearly that German work has become relatively much more precarious, that you have an increase in total employment at the expense of the quality of those jobs, that the welfare system, while certainly much better than say the United States, is much more threadbare than it was in Germany. And that led to an increase in poverty rates in Germany, particularly with people with jobs. That meant that you could have an increase in employment that was not matched by an increase in household spending. And uh, at the same time, as you, it, it facilitated a relative tightening of the German government budget balance. So this is the period during which Germans, uh, Germany's trade surplus is generated and expands dramatically. And I think it's worth pointing out, just reiterating one more time, that this wasn't driven by a growth in exports. That if you look at the growth rate of German manufacturing exports <clears throat> in the 1990s, it was worth, in real terms, it was about 9% a year um, you know, on average. In the 2000s, when the trade surplus was expanding, the growth rate in exports was about 4% a year. So it wasn't because exports grew more rapidly. It was purely a function of the fact that import growth uh, slowed down even further. And as German companies cut their domestic investment and as German companies cut their wage bill, but nevertheless were able to maintain sales growth because they were selling to the rest of the world, that's how you generate, again, this, this chart on the right, which shows the trade surplus is basically going purely in sort of profits, retained earnings. And of course, the question is, where did that money go? All right, this is, you know, getting back to our original point, it all, everything has to go somewhere. If that money had been, you know, invested, obviously it wasn't invested, invested domestically. It wasn't even used to purchase German domestic financial assets either. Uh, what in fact happened, because again, that would have eventually generated, you know, some kind of change in German financial conditions that would have led to, you know, more borrowing and lending somewhere else. If it had, you could have imagined a situation such as what you had in the United States, for example, where, you know, rich Germans would have financed some kind of housing and consumption bubble by poorer Germans, but that's not what happened. What instead happened is that these surpluses were recycled through the German banking system 
uh, predominantly into the rest of Europe before 2008. And essentially, you can you can look at the value of you know the cumulative current account surpluses or net financial outflows. It was entirely due to the fact that German banks were accumulating accumulating foreign assets much more than they were accumulating foreign liabilities, and the difference was about 800 billion euros cumulated over between you know 2000 to 2008, give or take. And you know essentially that was German savers, mostly you know the rich, that were driving this. German household savings rates really didn't move. And in fact, if you look at the contributions to Germany's current total current account balance during this period, it was overwhelmingly the corporate sector, which shifted from uh, contributing you know, a several percentage points of deficit to a very, very large surplus. And that's really what explains the shift. Okay, so I think the story is that that's the story before 2008 and i think we know you know sort of the corollary of this which is what happened in the rest of europe which is predominantly where the, you know those sort of net flows of, of capital and, and finance went so what about after uh 2008 so this is where you see essentially the rest of europe ending up the way germany ended up um as a consequence of the euro crisis and the financial crisis so what you can see on the chart on the left here, and this is just very straightforward, household consumption, you know, GDP, those things should move in line. The entire point of having, you know, an economy, that's the point of producing things ultimately to support household consumption. So it makes sense that those things grow together. And what you see is that starting around the time of the Euro crisis and sort of 2010, 2011, in Europe, they become disconnected. And you see a pretty expansive gap occurring. And that's essentially, you know, to oversimplify, but that's essentially why Europe as a whole, the Euro area specifically, gener generated a very large trade surplus after 2008. And, or really after, excuse me, after sort of 2011, 20, 2012. And the reason why this happened, we can see in the chart on the right specifically, is that the countries in, in the Euro area that had been absorbing the excess production from Germany and also the Netherlands, which is an important but you know much smaller country here, uh, they were forced through changes in their financial conditions and partly through changes that were imposed by governments, whether it was the ECB or the idea of the fiscal compact, to dramatically um, restrain their own domestic spending. And that ended up leading to a shift in, in Europe's overall external position. And I think it's important to note here, you, you can't see it in the chart, but the the shift in the net position was not driven by an increase in exports for the most part, with the with the possible exception of Portugal, which really did see an impressive um, tourism boom. Overwhelmingly, what happened was really severe declines in domestic demand. In other words, household consumption and investment, both public infrastructure investment and business investment in all the major crisis countries. Even ones that have done relatively better, such as Spain, for example, you still see the domestic demand you know, before the coronavirus was well below where it had been. And that shift, which was not offset by some countervailing shift in the position of you know, countries such as Germany and the Netherlands, or for that matter, you know, countries that basically stayed the same, such as France, that shift led to the growth of Europe's overall current account balance. And incidentally, the shift in the, the decline in domestic demand was, was essentially perpetuated by the same policies that had affected Germany, which was extreme restraint in public infrastructure spending, uh, increasing precarity of work and, and degrading of you know, workers' rights and employment protections, increases in consumption taxes, particularly that, uh, and changes in the social insurance system. And those things had relatively predictable effects. Uh, in addition to, of course, you know, corporate companies in households sort of acting on their own to just cut spending and, and retrench or the lack of, of finance becoming available. And unsurprisingly, that also led to an increase in inequality in those countries. So there's a study from uh, economists at, at Bruegel a couple of years ago that tracked this. And they found that actually, if you look at um, Spain, for example, that basically rich Spaniards had no real meaningful change in their income distribution, that the, that the decline in sort of Spanish national income was purely borne by people lower down the spectrum. And that's, that is consistent with our overall story of how this works, because you know, if rich people lose income, they're not gonna cut their spending anyway, so that wouldn't really have an, an impact on, their, on the current account balance. And uh, you know, that is essentially how we ended up um, where we are with, with Europe. And, and, and the striking thing is that it might, it might change. Um, I, I think actually the, the, the story behind Germany's response to the coronavirus and the relative willingness of the German government to support the recovery um, fund and the issuance of bonds by the European Commission directly, I think is a really interesting development and you know worth watching closely. It fits with the kinds of things we talked about that would be helpful in the book. But 
you know, this is the story where we are now. And, and um, I think, you know, this is important context for understanding the German current account surplus and how that turned into Europe's current account surplus as a whole. Many thanks, Matt. Uh, very uh, interesting, very exciting. Um, I hand over immediately to Till, uh, who will uh, comment on your thinking. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's great uh, to be here. Um, I read um, Matt and Michael's book uh, yesterday and today, and I recommend it very much. It's a, it's a great book, and I learned um, a great deal about uh, economic history in particular. Um, so it, it's really recommended. Uh, I had followed, in fact, Michael Pettis's work um, for several years now, and um, his previous book, The Great Rebalancing, was a great inspiration uh, to me and my co-authors, and we also um, like uh, cite him a lot in our own work. So I, I thought I like I was given seven minutes to comment on this um, very rich book, so that's not much. And so I thought I would also like produce a couple of slides, just a few slides, as a self-discipline device, so I don't talk uh, too long. So. Um, I tried to, to summarize here the argument that is made by uh, Klein and Pettis in their book. And I, I think it's fair to say that they start from the observation that the, the rich world is no longer characterized by scarcity, but rather by glut. So I have this uh, quote here from their book. Scarcity stopped being a serious problem in the rich world sometime near the last quarter of the 20th century. If there were more, uh, more work to be done, people could easily be found to fill the jobs. The problem has been an absence of demand for their labor. So they talk about the, the great glut and they also use this controversial term of the saving glut. I, I don't think we have to go into this debate here whether or not one can talk about a saving glut or not, but uh, I think this uh, assessment here is, is, is fair. And then they argue as uh, my co-author Jan Beringer and I have also argued in, in, in various uh, publications that inequality is the like fundamental cause of weak domestic demand in many uh, countries. Um, and that it also caused the current account surpluses uh, of China and Germany in particular, because you go uh, at great length in the book to talk about these two um, cases. Um, and I, as, I, as I see it, your main argument is basically um, the old Keynesian argument, if you want, that rich households and businesses have a lower propensity to, um, to consume, to save, so they have a higher propensity to save than the non-rich. And so if you redistribute income from the consuming classes, as Hobson put it, you, you also have these very nice um, quotations from uh, Hobson in your book. Um, uh, uh, so you just redistribute income away from the consuming classes to the super rich who, who save mo uh, like a large fraction of their income, then you end up with a with the weakness of, 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 of demand. You also argue that the US is kind of an exception because it combines high and rising inequality and the current account deficit. And so your main conclusion, as I see it, is that inequality needs to be reduced uh, first and foremost in the current account surplus countries because this is where you really put the focus uh, on. And this will then automatically more or less reduce the current account deficit of the US and other uh, Anglo-Saxon countries. Um, so I, I agree with the general argument and I would just note two qualifications here, general qualifications, and, and then I turn to the case of Germany, which I think we are mainly concerned uh, about today. So the very like first thing that I'd like to, to, to mention here is that like the very fundamental uh, basic um, a notion that excess aggregate production obviously can also be addressed through the reduction of working time and not only through the stimulation of aggregate demand. And as you all know, this is what Keynes basically suggested that um, if uh, we end up in a situation after like several decades after the Second World War uh, of generalized overproduction, then um, reducing working time uh, is, is a very nice way of getting rid of the uh, excess uh, uh, production. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm just mentioning this here and not going into the details, but I think that if we talk about a new paradigm uh, and, 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 and about uh, overproduction and a lack of a uh, aggregate demand, then I think working time reductions shouldn't, should be an option that should not be off the table um, uh, from the start. 
So, so, th so this is just uh, a brief comment here. Then the second, not disagreement, but, but qualification that I would like to notice is that in my opinion, the debt-led growth model uh, and the current account deficit of the United States and also other Anglo-Saxon economies, uh, the UK is rather similar in that respect, are in my opinion themselves linked to domestic income inequality. So there is a lot of research now also based on uh, uh, micro level data that suggests that actually the decline in the saving rate in the US, personal household saving rate in the US has its cause uh, not least in the rise in income inequality at the very top of the distribution as uh, the middle class in the US uh, actually tried and keep up with the ostensive consumption of the rich uh, on, uh, on positional goods. And, and here you mentioned the role of the welfare state. The welfare state is not as developed in the US as it is in, in Germany, for example. So I think this is a, a, um, a, a great difference between Germany and the US. In both countries, you have this rise in income inequality, but in the US, uh, like the middle class has to uh, has to pay for education, health, housing, and, and so on, uh, privately. And so, as income inequality increases, this puts pressure on the rest of the 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 the, the, the population uh, to to keep up with the with the increased consumption norms and the increased relative consumption on on education, housing, healthcare, and so on um, uh, of of the rich. And so, the the rise in income inequality, in my opinion, is all, is is in itself. A, uh, uh, a, a cause of the decline in saving uh, uh, in the household sector in in the U.S. and and in, in reading your book, it, it sometimes um, seems as if um, like the only problem is the rise in income inequality in 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 the surplus surplus countries. But I, I I would argue that also in the deficit countries, income inequality plays a role in explaining the the macro uh, uh, economic imbalances and and the current account deficit. So this is basically an interaction between income inequality and social infrastructure. And of course, the easier access to debt in the in the U.S. and Germany, it's a lot di more difficult to 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 for for households below the top of the distribution to get a credit and to substitute debt for 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 income, um, uh, and, and that's I think a difference between Germany and the U.S. Okay, but but I uh, I think we want to talk mainly about Germany, and here I must say I I, I fully agree with with the analysis that is in the in the book, and I think a very important point. Um, uh, to make is that the current account surplus of Germany is not primarily the result of household thriftiness, but rather we have to look at fiscal policies, so the government sector and the corporate sector. And in my opinion, the fiscal policy, the the infam um, um, infamous debt break, German debt break, needs substantial report, uh, reform, and we need to look at the role of the, uh, the corporate sector. So. I just have three more slides. So basically, you talked about this uh, slide uh, in your um, remarks. Here we have the three sectoral financial balances of the household sector, the corporate sector, and the, the government sector. And the blue bars, this is the, uh, the household sector. And you see that since 1980, I mean, this is Germany after all. So uh, the households are always in surplus, but, but it doesn't like change all that much. It's always between three and 5% or so. The big shifts that we can see are with the government sector. So the government was in deficit like most of the time as, as, as is normal in, 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 in most developed countries. But then we had these surpluses in the, in the government sector over the past 10 years. And even more importantly, the corporate sector was in deficit most of the time uh, in the after war period. But then since 2002 and every single year, we see this, um, these financial surpluses in the in the corporate sector, and this is really this is really um, noteworthy. And so, if we dig a bit deeper and and see where this surplus comes from, uh, it, it actually comes from corporate saving. So here, with the the blue line, this is corporate saving as a percent of GDP. So you have to look at the right axis here. And the green line, this is investment. So investment goes down a little bit. There has been all this debate about declining relative prices of investment goods with the rise of intangible uh, uh, capital uh, uh, and so on. But, but really the, the driving force behind the rising surplus of the, the corporate sector is this increase in corporate saving. And, um, and when, as part of a current project that we are working on using uh, micro level data, we produced this graph that shows that the, the increase in, the, in, in corporate saving really comes from 
family uh, firms in Germany. So this is one of the peculiarities of the German corporate sector. There is this dominant of the so-called Mittelstand and the family owned firms. And what really happened is that the family owned firms essentially used their firms as, as piggy banks, as uh, some observers uh, noted, because for tax reasons, it's preferable for them to keep uh, money inside the firm rather than uh, distribute profits basically to them to, to, to themselves, the manager owners. And, um, and also family firms want to be independent from, from the financial markets, from, from, from banks. And, and so uh, it, it's interesting to, to see that this rise in corporate saving and the, the corporate surplus really comes, appears to be coming from, from the family owned uh, firm, firms, the so-called uh, Mittelstand. And so uh, in, in this chart here, I just want to emphasize also we, uh, in, in, in your book, you say, and I, I also said in my brief comments here that one simil similarity of Germany and the US is the increase in, in income inequality. So in the book, at some point you say, usually one would expect the US also to have current account surpluses because we also have this current account, like the, the increase in inequality as we also um, see in, in Germany. I just want to, to draw your like, attention to the fact that the, the pattern of income inequality in Germany and the US has been rather different. So here in the left chart, you see this, um, this um, skyrocketing of the top 1% income share in the US, whereas in Germany, the top 1%, so at the very top of the distribution, the 1% the household income share remains essentially flat, on, at least until the crisis. There is not much going on here. But when we then look at the, the, the wage share, so that's the, the share of the national income that goes to wages as opposed to, to profits, really declines much more strongly in Germany, this is the solid line here, than in the US, especially until the, the crisis. And so what really happened in my opinion is that in Germany, you have this, very strong increase in profits, but profits are retained by the Mittelstand, by the family owned firms. They don't pay um, very high uh, um, uh, salaries, CEO compensation, because the Mittelstands are themselves the owners of the corporations and they want to keep uh, their profits within the firm to uh, maintain independence from the, from the financial markets and also for tax reasons. And so these, incomes, these profits, they aren't spent on consumption. Uh, they are saved within the firms. Whereas in the US, you have more of a system where managers, external CEOs, they try and get as much cash out of the firms as, as, as possible. Um, and, and the beneficiaries really of this American model um, of rising inequality were the top uh, uh, CEOs, top managers, uh, which are behind this um, very strong increase in the top 1% household income share. So incomes go leave the corporate sector in the US and, um, and, and, and lead to an increase in income inequality between households. And so, so incomes go uh, to the household sector and are then used for consumption purposes. So th these incomes, um, salaries of, of, of management are, uh, um, are um, um, spend on uh, uh, um, education, private education, private schools, private uh, universities. They are spent on um, healthcare, on housing. And this puts pressure on, on the middle class to follow these rising consumption norms and to keep up with the rich. And this may have driven down the, uh, the saving rate in, uh, in, in the US. And you don't observe this in, in, in Germany because really the beneficiaries of the, the rise in income inequality in Germany are the the owner managers that have this very strong propensity to, to save. And so, yeah, I mean, we also try to put these ideas into formal econometric work here. We, we estimated a current account uh, equation uh, in which, so this is a standard current account model. I'm not going to go into the details, but we add different measures of income inequality. So here we have the top household income shares. This is personal inequality and we see a negative effect of rising top end income inequality on the current account. And we interpret this as evidence or at least as consistent with the notion of trickle down consumption or expenditure cascades, keeping, keeping up with the Joneses uh, uh, kind of uh, effects. And you also have a negative effect here um, 
of the weight share on the current account. And this is basically what, what, what happened in Germany and also in, in China, where the, the, the changing income distribution really benefited not so much the, the top income households, but rather the, um, the, corporate, the corporate sector. And so, um, yeah, um, uh, th that's, th that's, that's all I have to, to say, I think, I, I guess, uh, um, uh, um, uh, on, on, on this. So there is broad agreement with, uh, with your general argument. Um, the, the ultimate cause, I think, of the macro imbalances that we have observed is this increase in, in or the, the shifts in income distribution. But I, but, I, but I would also emphasize that it's good to, to look at different patterns of, 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 of uh, changing income distribution across countries. And in Germany, obviously, it's, it's the, the, the fall in the weight share, the rise in corporate saving that then uh, translates into this um, excessive current account, current account surplus. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, Till. Um, Matt, would you uh, comment on the comments? Yes, thank you very much. First of all, you know, Till, thank you. That was some really interesting stuff in there. And you know, I wish we had a chance to see that research about the difference in saving behavior between family-owned versus non-family-owned firms. We would definitely want to have included that in the book, maybe in a, in a second edition. Uh, I completely agree with you that the patterns of, of distribution between com companies to their owners are different across the two countries. And in fact, in the book, we try to use the phrase, the rich and the companies they control sort of as a catch-all to sort of account for those, those nuances, because it's absolutely right. And I, I think, you know, in practice, if it's not showing up in the household income because it's not distributed, but the household owns the company and can use the company to cover their spending and to save on their behalf, then it really is that household, even if we're not, you know, the data aren't capturing it fully. So I think that that's, you know, in practice, that's why I think the stories are similar, even if there's some interesting nuances in the difference between managers and, and owners there. Um, one thing I would, I would might slightly disagree with is, is the idea that in the US model, it leads to more consumption of, of goods by the rich or that there's a, you know, the, the sort of middle classes in the US are, are trying to, you know, consume more to keep up with the rich, which is that we don't see, for the most part, you know, if the rich had been in the U.S. had been consumed, or the higher income managers had been consuming everything they were getting, as opposed to reinvesting a large portion of those, you know, wage income or you know compensation into you know corporate equity and bonds and, and so forth, then that wouldn't have generated, you know, the high savings rates that we've seen among the rich. So there's there's a chart that I didn't show here, but actually I can pull it up. Um, a different slide, just a second, that um, looks at you know the US specifically. And what you can see is that the savings rates among uh, high income people in the US are, are quite high. That you know among the top 1% as a whole, it's almost 50%. And that is presumably even higher among sort of the top 0.1%. And then the fact that, you know, there's a paper that came out earlier this year, which, you know, we would have included if it had been, you know, available earlier, which is essentially saying that if you look at sort of the contribution to the dissaving by sort of the bottom 90% of the US population, it was about 50% the US rich, 50% the rest of the world. And I think that that's consistent with the fact that there was, um, you know, the sort of saving glut is, you know, how much of it's international versus is domestic is, is in some ways a little bit arbitrary. Um, and there wasn't a, sorry, the, the last, last very brief point is I don't think there was, a, it's, it's right to say there was a consumption boom in the United States. I know this is a very popular um, view both among Americans and, and, and outside, but if you look at sort of the the long term trend of, of inflation adjusted consumption per person in the U.S., it's remarkably stable since the end of World War II, and in fact that it was slightly below trend or slower basically in the years after 2000. And that's consistent with the fact that you had relatively weak uh, consumer price inflation and relatively weak employment. And I think that the insufficiency of employment and production in the U.S. was at least as much, if not the dominant driver of the U.S. current account deficit as, you know, excess consumption, which I think is a different story, by the way, than what you see in some of the peripheral European countries where, you know, in Spain, for example, or in Ireland or Greece, where you have a very different kind of story, but at least in the U.S. context, I think it's all different. So that's, that's all I say, but I, I thought that was a really interesting presentation. I, I love that data on the difference between family-owned and uh, non-family-owned firms. Okay, thanks, uh, Matt. What I'm, I would be interesting in, uh, interested in is um, a little bit more developing the reasons why are co why, why is corporate saving as high? Is there, I mean, if we will come to some conclusions on political on the political level, what to do about it, Till and, and both to both of you, 
I mean, is there something, I mean, you alluded some uh, ideas, but maybe there's something bigger behind the corporate saving, like in, in, secu in security or uh, in, in after the global financial crisis or things like that. So is there something that you would take out or what, what, what you would say that's the main reason for this change, which has not only happened in Germany? Is that only political? Is it, is it a political econ economy question or is there something different like the global crisis or uh, insecurity that leads firms to spend less and to, to save more? So the, the thesis that we have is that essentially, you know, for, first of all, it's, I don't think political explanations are the, the main driver for the corporate saving behavior. And in fact, in, in Germany and a lot of other countries that have this phenomenon, they the corporate saving behavior preceded the big political changes. Uh, I think that there are a couple of things that we can point to. One is that in all the countries that have had this phenomenon, it's followed a very significant, you know, asset bust. You know, Japan really was the first mover here in the 1990s. Richard Kuz and a lot of this work, um, basically showing this massive shift in the behavior of Japanese businesses after the bubble burst there, and they've sort of consistently been in retained earnings mode since the mid 1990s. Germany and the U.S. actually had a similar experience after 2000 with the tech bust. One of the points we talk about in the book is that you can actually see very similar moves in, in both countries there in the businesses. So I think a lot of it is reacting to this, you know, a period of what they, you know, overinvestment ended up paying off really badly. Um, and then the question is, why did that happen? And I think the sort of underlying argument is that, you know, there wasn't enough consumer demand. And this gets back to the inequality thesis. So our sort of simple, but I think reasonable view is that companies, at least in the aggregate, will increase their investment when demand is growing and they don't have enough existing capacity to meet that demand. And if you have a situation where there's already excess capacity, which you can see in a variety of measures, and demand is not growing as much as it was before, or just you don't think it's going to grow that much either, because you know in the German case, people talk about demographics, or um, you know you could also I think the distribution of income itself I think is can be a constraint on demand is sort of the argument of our book as well. Those things will then lead to less investment, and in fact this is an argument that you know again goes back to the 1930s at least of you know why are businesses investing? You know there's there are reasons for this, and you know Hobson's point was that if you if you increase the uh, purchasing power of the consuming classes, essentially, then that will create incentives to invest. And then that solves the problem, or at least will make existing investments more profitable. The, you know, sort of slightly later sort of Keynesian and Alvin Hansen view is that if businesses want to invest, the government should invest on their behalf, you know, regardless of what, I mean, I, I think in a lot of, you know, advanced economies, you can say, you know, both would be useful. But um, I think that is sort of the underlying issue. And I, I think corporate saving is definitely not a uniquely German problem. I think, in fact, you know, the most extreme in, is probably in Japan, but you know, it's a, it's, it's really sort of an advanced economy issue and differences across countries. You can really attribute to how the government and household sectors respond to this corporate saving glut. So would you add something on that? Yeah, question? maybe I can add one or two um, aspects here. So Matt has covered a lot of ground and I agree with all of what he just said. Um, I guess in, well, corporate, the, the rise in corporate saving has been a big topic also in, in, in academia in the past, I don't know, four or five years or so. Before that, few people actually looked at, at this phenomenon. And in the chart that we just saw, we also saw that it's actually, actually a secular trend in, in, in Germany. So this phenomenon started in Germany in the 1980s, 1990s, and not just as a post-crisis phenomenon, because I think in, in much of the literature, is, it's often described as a, as a post-crisis crisis phenomenon because there's so much insecurity and uncertainty. And so um, firms hoard, hoard cash. But, but, but in the German case, I think it's, it's a longer trend and which, in my opinion, is linked to to the development of the um, of the functional income distribution, because uh, as we saw in the charts, the this fall in the in the share of the national income going to wages and the the, the rise in the share of profits um, uh, um, uh, um, actually started in the in, in the 1980s, and 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 corporate savings started along um, with it. In the German case, I think it's also important to look at the changes to the tax system. Uh, so in 2001, there was the reform of the corporate income tax that uh, favored uh, retained earnings um, as compared to um, 
uh, to distributed profits. So it has become uh, advantageous for firms to retain their profits and taxes are lower. Uh, and, in, and then also in 2002, before 2002, we had very high taxes on, um, um, on um, uh, capital gains um, uh, that you had to pay when you, when you sold um, uh, equity. Uh, and, and, and this basically um, was um, um, a way to almost like make it impossible for, for, for firms to, um, um, that, that, that basically made hostile takeovers almost impossible because you had to, have, you had to pay such high uh, taxes on, on, on asset gains. And this tax was then in 2002 completely repealed. And so uh, the, um, the, the risk for, in particular, the Mittelstand to um, uh, of hostile takeovers is is much more present since then uh, as compared to to before. And then there was all this talk that the German Mittelstand didn't have enough equity, and so the, uh, and, and and I think that's that's another reason why um, why firms may have wanted to to uh, improve their their, their equity um, and base. And then of course there's the inheritance tax. So in Germany, if um, if the the son or the daughter like um, um, takes over the firm from from their parents and then they don't they 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 don't reduce employment uh, uh, in a certain period of time then they don't have to pay any inheritance taxes, and so it's it's obviously better for for middle stand uh, owner managers to inherit um, business assets as compared to personal uh, wealth. And so th th that's what I meant when I said that apparently some, some like rich families in Germany are using their, their firms as, as, as piggy banks, uh, which is a, a common argument. Okay, are there any uh, questions on, on the audience or would you like to Rex, Matt? Tom, yeah. Sorry, I got to unmute myself too, which I'm always clumsy at. Um, I'm sorry I missed most of Matt's, Matt's presentation. What I heard of it, I liked a lot, and I agree quite thoroughly with Till's. I, know, I just want a couple of comments on the savings glut story. We at INET just put out this paper by Lance Taylor, and he just walks you through the Bernanke presentation and then shows you it's mathematically overdetermined. I mean, the Mundell Fleming stuff that everybody closes these models for can't be right uh, in a world general equilibrium. And, uh, you know, he comes out with a position that is extremely close. I think it's identical with Till's um, in many respects on the way. Um, on what actually drives what in these discussions. I would just one other comment, which is I've always gagged on the stories that US savings rates are basically about imitating the rich. Unless you, if you actually walk through it, you could maybe make that case for some parts of housing. I mean, that might be true. And maybe a, some parts of consumer borrowing to buy, I don't know, although I wouldn't think that a washing machine or something is actually necessarily imitating the rich. But when you look at, say, the, I just saw where total student debt is now $1.5 trillion. That's just going to college. That's really exactly what Till was pointing out. There. You, know, you don't have a welfare state that sort of gives you at least cheaply affordable college. Well, you're gonna to have to do that. And while I think the, Elizabeth, the original Elizabeth Warren story, the bankruptcy was coming from heavy medical debts is a little overstated. It's not that far overstated. Medical debt is enormous. And that, I mean, again, if you, okay, maybe technically trying to stay alive is emulating the rich, uh, but uh, you know, I think people might want to just look again. I, mean, I think Till's got it right for the many of the basics of that debt drive. Uh, when you actually examine the stuff in the totals, you know, you're, you know, except on housing and a little bit of consumer stuff, you can't, it's, you can't really make the case. Right. If I can just add to this, um, Matt, you showed this chart by Sez and Zygman. 
um, on the differential saving propensities. So what I, I, I know that chart and, and, and what always strikes me when I look at it is that uh, much of the decline in the aggregate personal household saving rate in the US actually came from the, um, the 90th to 99th percentile. So this is the 10 percentiles just below the top 1%. And I think here one can really make the case that there has been some emulation uh, going on because the, 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 the top 1% increased their incomes had saw their income is increased. The saving rate is roughly stable. So um, absolute consumption rises at the, at the very top of the distribution. And this puts pressure on those income percentiles just below the top one, because they also want to send their kids to the best schools that money can buy. And, and you know they want to live in the best houses and in the best areas that, that money can buy. But in order to do that, they have to then reduce their, their saving rate. So this is not about the poor causing the crisis by, you know, spending um, on luxury goods that they can't afford. I, I think this story is really about what has been going on within the top ten or within the top twenty percent of the of the of the distribution. But this obviously is an aside to to our main debate here about about Germany. But but but, but when we compare the two economies, I think it's just important to 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 to, to realize that these kinds of expenditure races are not happening in Germany because the top 1% is, is, is saving a lot more, uh, keep their incomes within firms, and they don't put, like, they, they don't shift the consumption norms as much as, as, in, as, in, the, as in the US because in, in Germany, a wealth and the rich are, are far less visible also in terms of their, their spending uh, than, than their counterparts in, in the US. You know, I might actually flip it around a little bit that the, the, the real difference between the US and Germany isn't necessarily this this, consump this sort of behavioral consumption story, but just the difference in the credit system, which which I know till you, you, you'd also mentioned as well that, you know, and this is something we talk about a lot in the book and on the US, you know, section, but that the US financial system is very, you know, if you want to use a positive term, it's very flexible, it's very accommodative of what people want to get out of it. But the other way of looking at it is that, um, you know, if you if if there is any possibility of lending to anyone in the United States, then the U.S. financial system will find a way to do it in, in scale and very quickly. And that's essentially, I think, a lot of what explains what happened in the 2000s. Whereas, you know, other countries don't really have that to the same degree. And that's part of the reason why money comes to the U.S. Because the flip side is you can generate assets that dollar dominant assets people can accumulate outside the U.S. But you know, the the flip side is that if you know it, financing a credit boom from people lower down the income spectrum is very relatively easy, whereas other countries, Germany don't have that. And so that's why you can see the, you know, the, the savings rate of the, you know, the bottom 90th, you know, chunk of the distribution going from, you know, plus 5% to negative 5% relatively quickly. Okay, many thanks, Matt. Um, if there aren't any direct questions on, on, on this um, anymore, I would like to ask you, I mean, given that you are a journalist and, and working for or having been and worked for the FT and the economist and, and our parents and I suppose you will be much more open to answer to a question like the one I wanted to raise your title the title of the book is about trade wars a class war so it refers very much to uh, the president of the United States to come one so as a as a economic but also perhaps perhaps a political observer what is your take on what will happen in November and then will there be much more trade wars afterwards or what is what would you suspect uh, what will happen in that sense well I have no special insight whatsoever into the election outcome compared to anything that that you all can read. So uh, that uh, on that dynamic, I mean, I, I think that, you know, regardless of who wins, though, I think that these trade issues are not going to go away. I mean, that's sort of why we wrote the book is that these are sort of fundamental issues that preceded Trump, and they will continue after, especially because there's nothing that's been done in the past several years to really alter any of these dynamics, either in the United States or in the rest of the world. So that I think that you're definitely going to see, you know, some big changes in different directions. I mean, one thing that's interesting that you can look at this sort of a, you know an alternative approach is if you look at the things that that Biden has put out recently about trade you can see there there's a similar appeal in trying to restore the U.S. manufacturing capacity and essentially offset some of offshore reshoring is I think one of the things they've talked about in, you know moving supply chains back 
And if you look at some of the things that they're talking about, they address, they're they, they are connected to some of the issues we talk about in the book in terms of, on the one hand, you have various idiosyncrasies in the US tax code that encourage, you know, for example, pharmaceutical production to move to Ireland. On the other hand, you also, if the, if the general problem is a lack of global demand for manufactured goods that happens to, for various reasons, have disproportionately affected the US, one way of dealing with this is having the US government just increase global demand for manufactured goods and make sure that that increased demand at least some of it is going to U.S. manufacturers. Now you can argue about whether that's you know, the ideal approach or what have you, but at least it's it's an approach that's consistent with the kind of framing we have in the book about you know what the problems are and what the sort of the realistic things that you know, deficit countries can do about them. Mm. So you would um, think that um, the, even irrespective of the outcome of the election, uh, trade issues will um, continue to to dominate and also be on the agenda for Germany, um, sort of coming from the US as a, as a topic, as an issue? Well, I mean, you probably know this better than I do, but I mean, my understanding is that, you know, German economic policy and, and Europe more generally were certainly a priority of the Obama administration as well in terms of, you know, some of the questions about, you know, contributions to sort of global spending and aggregate demand. And so I, I again, I, I don't think, I think that they're, you know, the, the specific approach that might be taken would certainly be different, but I think that, you know, whoever, wins i mean these these are fundamentally significant economic issues and and you know that i, I don't see them just disappearing based on like i said our, our argument is that these are these have been issues that have been consistent for a while where they've been recognized and so you know again you know the approach that people might take to them could vary but that the the basic you know importance of dealing with them is is just going to be as significant you know after november as before Mm, yeah. Um, so I'm. There's one quick question, but maybe we should um, should put that in, on the agenda for a bilateral answer because we are running out of time. We promised to keep the one hour, and for this format, um, anyway, we will reconvene in a way. We can we we'll meet again, and then maybe a little bit the other way around. So you will comment on. Uh, till um, which is at our main next big um, new paradigm uh, workshop in end of September, on 29th of September. Uh, this has been now today an input for, and as you saw, Till has read your book to to integrate now in in his work uh, for us, uh, which which we commissioned on the on the study on this paper on how to reduce Germany's current account surplus, which is what we discussed and what we will continue dis to discuss at that moment. Um, so we will maybe have even bilateral exchanges in between, but then uh, our session, which is in the afternoon of 29th of September, but you will all know um, um, when we, when Till and Achim and uh, Jan will present the paper and Matt will uh, comment on this um, and other people will comment. So. Uh, let's think about all that for the time being and uh, then reconvene and see um, and read that paper and see the presentation of Till. Thanks a lot both, uh, Matt and, and Till, for your presentations. Uh, very exciting, very interesting and helpful. I think um, we're doing some progress on that topic because for some years it was quite difficult to, very emotional, very political, but uh, maybe now there is much more insight due also thanks to your work. So thanks a lot and uh, have a nice day in California and evening for most of the others, I think. Uh, so see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.